Nancy Pelosi is no friend to progressives. She is an obstacle to progress because she doesn't just not support progressive policies like Medicare for all or tuition free public college, but she's either wittingly or unwittingly aligning with Republicans in order to make sure that those policies don't get passed. She's endorsing a rule known as PAYGO. She's supporting a tax rule that makes it procedurally impossible for progressive legislation to get passed. So there's a ton of problems with Nancy Pelosi. However, we're in this situation where going into the 2019 and 2020 congressional session, it seems as if we're stuck with Nancy Pelosi. And I hate to say it, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but no other left-wing challenger has emerged to contest that seat. And look, Barbara Lee would have made an excellent speaker, but unfortunately for all of us, she's not running to be speaker. She's running for caucus chair. Now that's important, and we should still support her because as caucus chair, perhaps one day she could be in a position to become speaker. But for now, it's just not something that she's interested in. And individuals like Marcia Fudge, who are considering a challenge to Nancy Pelosi, they seem really questionable because even if she might technically be more liberal economically speaking, she's arguably more socially conservative and she also doesn't think that campaign finance reform should be a priority for Democrats in 2019. So I don't necessarily know that Marcia Fudge would be preferable to Nancy Pelosi and as a result it doesn't look like Marcia Fudge is going to be able to muster up the support needed to be speaker. So with that being said, it seems like Nancy Pelosi is poised to become speaker now for the 150th time. <laughs> and it's just, it's really, it's demoralizing, right? Because there was all this progressive momentum that carried Democrats to victory. And you would think that in response to the call for change from across America, Democrats would refuse to go with someone like Nancy Pelosi again. But unfortunately, that doesn't look like it's going to be the case. Now, with that being said, there's two sides within the Democratic Party that have emerged. There's one side of House Democrats that are pledging to oppose Nancy Pelosi's bid to be Speaker again on the House floor. And 16 of these Democrats have actually signed a letter stating their intent to oppose her. And there's also three other House Democrats that have stated their intent to oppose her, even if they haven't signed onto the letter. So in the event these 19 Democrats hold strong, then that actually does pose a serious threat to Nancy Pelosi's chances of retaking the role of Speaker again. But there's a catch. These individuals, these 19 House Democrats who are planning to oppose Nancy Pelosi, are opposing her for all the wrong reasons. Because these are not progressive Democrats. These are actually corporate Democrats who are opposing Nancy Pelosi because she's not conservative enough. Not even kidding. If you could believe that, because that's, that's almost insane to fathom that someone would think that she's too liberal. The problem is that she's too conservative, but nonetheless, these 19 Democrats are opposing Nancy Pelosi because they want the individual who's next in line to become speaker. And that person is Steny Hoyer, who I don't even have to tell you about, would be exponentially worse for progressives. Because if you thought that Nancy Pelosi was bad, who is endorsing Pago and is against progressive policy ideas, Steny Hoyer is 10 times worse than Nancy Pelosi. So I can't stress to you enough, we absolutely should do everything in our power to make sure that Steny Hoyer not only fails to become the speaker ever, but that we oust him so he's never in a position to become speaker because that is honestly the worst case scenario. So instinctively, it may seem as if progressives should theoretically align with these 19 Democrats to oppose Nancy Pelosi, but in doing so, they risk getting Steny Hoyer. Now, on the other side of the aisle, there are some Democrats who are pledging support to Nancy Pelosi, and this includes progressive Democrats such as Ro Khanna, Pramila Jayapal, Ilhan Omar, and Deb Holland. And additionally, 
it seems as if Ocasio-Cortez will support Pelosi as well because she signaled support for Pelosi. And on one hand, it is genuinely disappointing to see progressives sign a letter stating their support for Nancy Pelosi because part of me thinks, why do this? Why surrender this early? Why not try to extract even more concessions from Nancy Pelosi and maybe demand that she abandon Pego and the tax rule she's proposing that kneecaps the progressive agenda? Because... It is the case that they're supporting her because she is promising them important committee assignments, which really is important. But at the same time, it's still early. The vote to be House Speaker, the official vote, mind you, irrespective of the nomination um, process, which will take place towards the end of this month, there's still the official vote in January. So why surrender this early? Why not try to put up a fight a little bit longer? Because it's obvious that these rules, these conservative rules that Nancy Pelosi is proposing at a minimum, are an olive branch to all of these right-wing Democrats who think that she's too liberal. But they're already planning to oppose her. So why not, if you're a progressive, why not use that as leverage against Pelosi and her opponents and force her to abandon these harmful procedural hurdles before endorsing her? Because they're not going to support her. So if they're not going to support her, why not explain to Pelosi that you have our support? So why would you give concessions to these right-wing Democrats who are already saying they're going to oppose you. So that's just what I would do. I would not have surrendered this early. But at the same time, I don't know about the internal dynamics that are going on behind the scenes. I don't know if Nancy Pelosi said you're only going to get this committee appointment if you endorse me immediately. So I, I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. But what I do know is that this is basically a lose-lose situation for progressive Democrats they can either oppose Pelosi and stand on principle but maybe be worse off, or they can support Pelosi and endorse Pelosi and get some type of concession from her. And it does seem as if she's willing to give them committee assignments. So, I mean, I understand their reasoning for supporting Nancy Pelosi, but I just wish that they wouldn't try to convince us that she's an ally in the process. So, for example, I was disappointed to see that Ilhan Omar released a statement praising Nancy Pelosi. I mean, you could just begrudgingly endorse her because we know that that's what you feel as if you have to do without praising her as the second coming of Christ or the best thing since sliced bread because we all know that Nancy Pelosi isn't a true progressive. She's a corporate Democrat. She's a prototypical quintessential example of a corporate Democrat. So we don't have to pretend as if she's anything otherwise. We don't have to pretend as if this isn't an unholy alliance that you made or, you know, a deal with the devil. We don't have to pretend as if that's not the case. You can just say, I'm going to vote for Nancy Pelosi because I support her leadership. Plain and simple. You don't have to pretend as if She's anything other than that. But I do want to explain to you because I was really frustrated with progressives who pledged to support Nancy Pelosi. But at the same time, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes because when you do that, when you try to be empathetic of their situation, it really is lose-lose for them. And I put together this graphic that kind of describes why the situation is so awful. So as you can see, there are four quadrants in total, and I'm calling this graphic the progressive Pelosi dilemma, because no matter the outcome here, the end result will essentially yield a net loss for progressives. So on one hand, if Pelosi wins, which is the more likely scenario, progressives who supported Pelosi will at least get some concessions, hopefully, from Pelosi in the form of important committee appointments and maybe some policy concessions. And these concessions will only be given to them, obviously, if they back Nancy Pelosi. However, if they reject Nancy Pelosi and she ends up becoming speaker again anyway, then they end up getting nothing. So they get no concessions, they get no committee appointments, nothing. So in the likely event that Pelosi does win, and it seems like this will in fact be the case, unfortunately, progressives likely felt compelled to support her because they see value in backing her at this time in order to empower themselves to pursue a very specific policy agenda that we all support in spite of the plethora of issues with Nancy Pelosi. However, if Nancy Pelosi loses, that's inherently good news because she's no friend to progressives, but since no one on the left of Pelosi has stepped up, that likely means Pelosi could lose to someone who's worse, like Steny Hoyer, as I mentioned. And in this situation, progressives who pledged support for Pelosi would be in the worst possible predicament if she lost, because by supporting Pelosi, they'll likely piss off the new incoming speaker, 
and they wouldn't get any committee appointments. But on the other hand, if they reject Pelosi and she also loses to st someone like Steny Hoyer, they wouldn't get any concessions, but they also wouldn't necessarily piss up the next speaker. But at the same time, if that speaker is Steny Hoyer, he's not going to be receptive to progressive policy goals anyway, and he probably wouldn't assign them to committee appointments anyway. So, I mean, it, it, there's no winning situation. Hopefully, this graphic demonstrates that. There's, there's no way for them to win. So, I get it. I see where they're coming from. I don't want you to get the impression that I feel disenfranchised by these progressives. I don't want you to think that they're selling out. They're in a shitty predicament. We're all in a shitty predicament, and really, they feel as if they have no choice but to back Nancy Pelosi. Now, with that being said, as I stated earlier, do they have to fawn over her and praise her in their endorsements and reluctant support of Pelosi? No. And part of me thinks that maybe because progressive Democrats in the House were so quick to get behind Pelosi, that that may have discouraged a potential challenger to the left of Pelosi from emerging because since they didn't think they'd have enough support from progressives to become speaker since everyone already endorsed Pelosi just two weeks after the election, maybe they felt as if they had nothing to gain and everything to lose by trying to challenge Pelosi because then that could potentially make them vulnerable to Pelosi stripping them of committee assignments. So either way, there's so much to consider. And again, I don't know the internal dynamic between these newly elected and incumbent House progressive Democrats and Nancy Pelosi. I don't know the stipulations of her concessions. I don't know everything. We don't have all of the information. So this is an imperfect analysis because I can't, I can't possibly give you a perfect strategy here when we don't have all the information. So with that being said, knowing what we know and as little details as we have to work with here. In essence, we're totally fucked. <laughs> I, I don't know um, how else to explain it. We desperately needed to get rid of Nancy Pelosi, and it just seems as if that's not an option. Because the group who is in the best position to oust Nancy Pelosi, they want to replace her with Steny Hoyer. So, and... Mind you, this isn't something that they've stated explicitly, but Steny Hoyer is next in line. These are right-wing Democrats, so if you put two and two together, it's obvious what they want. So it's just a really frustrating situation because I see how progressives were backed into a corner, and in endorsing Pelosi, they felt as if they would be in a better position expecting her to become the next speaker, which is likely. So, you know, I just hope that whoever is the next speaker, in spite of what they said about Pelosi in spite of their endorsements, they hold her accountable because she's proposing procedural rules that are really harmful, that make passing a progressive agenda impossible so long as she's speaker. And it's already impossible to get any policy we want codified into law, given that the Senate is still under Republican control and the White House is occupied by Donald Trump. But with that being said, now is the time to build a coalition and a consensus around progressive policy goals. And Nancy Pelosi, so long as she remains speaker, will be an obstacle to that goal. I see that progressives in Congress are trying to make sure that we don't worsen the odds by getting someone like Steny Hoyer. So it is what it is, but it's certainly um, a little discouraging, especially after all of the momentum after the election. Support this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash humanist report.